And so our uh, guest speaker tonight is Jonathan Jernigan. Um, and uh, I discovered Jonathan a, a couple months back. I'd been dabbling in, in Generate Press and Generate Blocks. And if you go on YouTube and look around for stuff on, on, that, on that topic, uh, you'll come across his channel. He's got a great YouTube channel. I really enjoy his videos. Um, there's certainly lots of good content on Generate Press and Generate Blocks. Um, and, but also all things WordPress. So, you know, he covers all kinds of stuff. Um, he's also got a, a, a website um, where he's got some courses that are uh, really cool. Um, a course on Generate Press and Generate Blocks, and also uh, a course on CSS, and a course on proposal writing. And uh, so, and then, and then uh, Jonathan, if that weren't enough, uh, he uh, runs an agency, a website agency. And while I think most of the world, we, we build out sites and, and charge a, a fee for the build out of the site and then perhaps sell a maintenance plan, uh, Jonathan has a different take on the business model for doing websites. So, and that's what he's gonna be uh, talking about tonight. Make sure I've got everybody that's in the waiting room in. There we go. So um, uh, I, the links to all three of those things are in the chat. So go ahead and check it out there. I encourage you to check out any of those three links. And so without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. And by the way, I, I think I mentioned he's in Florida, so it's late. So we really appreciate it. <laughs> Before you go, we're not seeing the, I'm not seeing the chat. I must have come in too late. Uh, yeah, I don't see it either. Could you resend it? I can do that. And don't don't coders stay up till like two in the morning anyway, Jonathan? <laughs> uh, ones that, that don't have 10-year-old little boys do. Yes, definitely. <laughs> do you guys see that in the chat? Yes. Testing, okay. yeah. I see that. Oh, okay. I, I, I put them in there before anybody joined. Maybe that's... Well, yeah. anything you put in the chat before anybody joins, nobody sees. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, because when you join, you only see things that are in the chat from the moment you join did not know that all right if you want to do it ahead of time put it in the uh comments at, at meetup.com and they'll be there oh okay okay and, and right. then nobody will see them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right that's right that's right so all right everybody um let's uh go ahead there and jonathan you can uh take it over awesome well i really appreciate the invite nice to see all of you um, I will go ahead and pop on this just very simple little slide deck I have. Oh, it says disabled screen sharing. If you want to hook me up with that, oh, please. Let me do that for you. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, so while David's working on that, um, he mentioned that I run my business on kind of a, um, monthly subscription website approach. So of course it's nothing revolutionary. Many, many people do it. Uh, I have uh, a good friend and mentor that really was kind of like the, the guide, um, guiding light for me on this that I implemented some time ago. Um, and so a lot of it has been things that I learned from him. So I'm really happy to share. I'm sure there's going to be tons of questions. So if, you know, I'm, I'm talking about something that you're particularly interested in, please feel free to, to stop me. Um, so just simply calling this uh, exploring monthly websites, just to kind of share with you what I do a little bit, and maybe provide some some uh, you know food for thought if this might be an approach you're interested in. Um, so just briefly about me, like David said, I'm based in Florida. I uh, started building WordPress websites in 2014, fresh out of college, and have been doing it ever since. Um, for many many years, I focused heavily on oxygen builder um and in the last you know a little bit over a year now i've been using generate press and generate blocks as my full-time page builders of choice so i'm heavily in the gutenberg arena and a large part of that shift is going to be based on um, or, or connected to what we're going to talk about in a little bit with the the monthly sites um kind of a big principle for me is the idea of simplicity both for you know me internally and my my uh, couple of contractors, but also for for clients to be able to modify their own websites simply. Um, and then outside of WordPress, 
I'm into all things cars. I love working on cars. I watch racing. I, I love everything about cars. So automotive is my passion. Um, and then of course you probably already assumed, but there's my girlfriend and my son. We were at uh, Universal Studios over the summer. So that was a, a very fun trip. Um, briefly on what I do through the agency, my company is called Apex Web Solutions. Um, and the, the primary factors in my business are I do uh, a lot of white label work for other web agencies. Typically it's custom development work. So it's membership portals and things of that nature. Um, and then the monthly websites is typically how I'm I'm selling projects to primarily local clients. So when somebody in my area, the city I live in is Destin, Florida, when somebody is Googling Destin web design and they contact me, they almost always fit into this monthly website approach that, that we'll talk about. And then I have two overseas contractors. Um, it, my role is, is primarily in client communication, project management, and that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of you know the the custom development work, that's that's typically me. So my two contractors normally handle the monthly sites and that arm of the business. And then uh, earlier this year, along with a partner and I, we developed a, a plugin uh, for WordPress called Pi Calendar. So it's just a very very simple event calendar plugin. Um, and so those three things kind of make up my my week typically my work week. So the monthly recurring sites that we're talking about very simple. In principle, um, these are simply just a, a pricing strategy where you're going to charge a few hundred dollars per month for X number of months that you can kind of dictate. And there normally is not any kind of upfront fee. There's not a not a setup fee or anything like that. So, so for me, I'll show you in just a little bit what the typical plans are like. But you'll see normally people are, are charging anywhere from you know 180 to $300 a month for something like 18 months, could be 24 months, depending on what you're comfortable with. Uh, a large part of these are going to be template driven. So, you know, with charging only a couple hundred dollars a month, you don't have a huge amount of billable hours that you could spend on this. And so having um, some templates will really help speed this up and keep efficiency high. And then a lot of people who are in this uh, monthly recurring site sort of niche typically have their, their own niche that they're focused on. Um, I have a, a good friend and she focuses exclusively on mental health practices and clinics. That's all she does. Uh, I have another friend who I mentioned is kind of my mentor in this. All he does is home services. So roofers and plumbers and, and, you know, people like that. Um, and so, you know, for me speci specifically, these plans, I charge based on just number of pages. So it's five, 10 or 25 pages. And those plans range from 180 a month up to 300 a month. And I charge on a 24 month agreement. So the, you know, the price obviously is easy to do. It's anywhere from like 4,500 up to as much as 6,000 over that, that period of time. And that monthly fee is all inclusive. So it's, it's essentially like a care plan included with the, with the plan. So you're going to provide hosting and monthly support that you can kind of dictate, but a lot of people tend to offer air quotes, unlimited monthly support, because of course, most clients we know don't take advantage of that. Maybe a few will, but most won't. And then for me, I try to offer really fast turnaround times with this because everything is standardized and, and simplified. You can shrink the, the the live time down. A large part of my goal switching to this uh, monthly recurring approach was it was taking me 90 plus days to launch small business websites, you know, could be sometimes as much as 120 days or clients disappear for months and months. I'm sure all of you can relate to, to those woes. Um, and so I really wanted to try to get every site live or at least mostly functional in 30 days or less. And, and you know, that was a, a key driver in this. So in terms of when we're looking at these kind of monthly sites as your primary focus, um, I tried to, to think about what are the upsides of this approach? Well, a large, uh, you know, a key factor for me is the fact that it's, it's really easy to qualify clients. You know, when somebody comes to your website, they're they're going to be able to see what you offer. They can see the prices ahead of time. And if they're a real estate agent and you don't offer real estate sites, you know, it really it really weeds out the people that are not going to be good fits for you. And that for me is a, um, you know, really important. The the quantity of leads that I get is not very high, but the the 
you know, likelihood that they're a good fit for me is, is very high as a result. Um, you know, a big part of this as well is the fact that everything is so simplified and um, just kind of dumbed down that there's no real complicated proposals that you're having, having to make. Um, and, you know, the payment process is so simple. You're not having to wait when you send a, you know, an invoice for 50% that's you know, whatever, it may be $3,000 or, or whatever. And you're waiting for your client to pay it for, for weeks. And that, that next 50% is held hostage on the back end because the site won't go live until it's been paid. And you know, that whole song and dance. So that was something that I wanted to eliminate as well. Um, and then also just the fact that these projects are very scalable because they're so standardized and so predictable. Um, it's far easier to scale this. You could probably manage, you know, eight or 10 of these individually more so than you could handle, uh, just kind of scattered random client projects that are of varying size and scope and that kind of thing. Um, of course, probably most attractively, the, the monthly recurring income, you know, can multiply really rapidly. So initially it may feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm only getting 200 bucks a month from this client. Whereas if I had just built a project rate, I'd already have 3,500 in the bank. It's like, well, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, but over time, collectively, all those monthly subscriptions really start to add up. And for me personally, it feels like it feels like I'm air quotes making more, you know, with with this monthly approach rather than um, project based. And then this last note here about there being very little risk for both parties. What I mean by that is um, my my mentor recommended and I do actively offer a a 30 day money back guarantee to clients. So that's something that you can really leverage because nobody in our space has any kind of guarantees like that. You would, you would not typically lead with, you know, we'll, we'll give you your money back in 30 days, but for you, there's almost no risk. Maybe you have some extra hours, but in terms of actual cash outlay, you're, you're not really out anything. And for the client, they feel like, okay, I can lean into this. I can get a feel for it. See if I'm happy with the process. And so far over the course of this year, um, I've been doing it a full year now as of, as of November, uh, I've only ever had one client actually take me up on the the thirty day money back guarantee. So it's not it's not going to be very common. Mm -hmm. But naturally, of course, not everything can be happy and and lively all the time. Um, so I wanted to kind of just document what I feel like are some of the gotchas or maybe some of the negatives of this. So, of course, naturally, some clients are going to be subscription averse. Adverse, averse, maybe I misspelled that. Hopefully not. Um, any of you grammar nuts out there, hopefully I didn't get, okay, cool. I'm good. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, you know, you're definitely going to have people that that come in and they say, oh no, I don't do monthly subscriptions. Hell no, no, definitely don't do that. Well, that's just part of it. But typically most people are not going to be uh, opposed to this, especially if their their business has steady cash flow. You know, it's not really going to make any kind of impact. Um, there are certain people that I've met through this kind of niche of people that offer monthly re recurring websites where they find that they're able to help businesses that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford this. Um, some people may look at that as a negative. Some people look at it as a positive. So kind of depends on, you know, your, your particular outlook on that. Um, with this approach, you can sometimes attract what I call pixel pusher clients, which are the ones that send you an email that say, move this image slightly up to the right. And then they say, oh no, actually put that back where it was, change this to blue. No, that's too blue. Put it back, make it orange, those kinds of things. That's definitely something that can happen. There's, there's a balance to be had with, you know, the types of clients that this particular, uh, pricing strategy will, will kind of, um, attract, but you know, you, you dictate the terms of this. So you can be very specific in in how that interaction, uh, can go. I'll show you, uh, later if, if you're interested a, an actual client project with this philosophy, and I'll show you exactly a, a pixel pusher scenario that I was actually able to kind of rectify pretty easily. Um, the other big thing is that it can be difficult to phase into this monthly approach if you're heavily project based. You know, if you're if your recurring revenue um, is is not very high at the moment, like you know, to be honest, mine's still not incredibly high. But um, phasing into this was a little bit difficult. I started to take on a few monthly sites at a time so that then I could still kind of keep some project based work going and you know keep keep cash flow 
coming into the into the business. So kind of making that crossover, if you if you decide that this is something you're going to really go full bore into, can can take some time. You know, for me, like I mentioned, I've I've been in it a year now. Um, and the, you know, the monthly recurring sites are not enough to just simply drop all project-based work, but it certainly is, is nothing to scoff at. Um, and then sometimes people look at the fact that these sites are relatively simple as a bad thing. If you're somebody that's doing heavily custom work, you love being really in the, the weeds, you know, getting dirt under your fingernails, this may not be the best approach for you. But for me, a large part of this, like I said early on, is, is the idea of simplifying as much of my business as I can. So, you know, when a client comes in, it's very easy to understand what they're getting. There's a, a very nominal monthly fee and you, you define the terms from the very beginning. They get X number of pages and it includes these features. So it's just super simple. Everything is clear from the outset. There's not a lot of ambiguity into when a client comes and asks you for a new page and you're like, well, uh, that wasn't in the initial scope. Uh, and then you, you got to go through that whole thing. Now it's like, well, your plan includes five pages. We can add a six one, but you know, it's going to be X hundred dollars. And they're like, yeah, go for it. Perfect. So it's very simple. Um, the onboarding flow now for, for my clients, which I'll touch on in a second is, is very consistent and super easy because there's not people who are, you know, needing X and Y, and you have some people that need Z, everybody is kind of in the same lane. It's really easy to build a, a semi-automated onboarding flow with checkout forms and, you know, Zapier and a couple other things. Um, and kind of going back to the idea of everything being consistent, it's super easy to plug in, uh, you know, internal team members to parts of the process. So I can show you, like I mentioned, one of my projects and my designer was able to go back and forth with the client to get things dialed in and I didn't have to be a part of it. So that's something that I, I'm still not perfect at. A lot of times I am the bottleneck and I'd like to remove myself more, but um, you know, that's, that's an important piece of this for me. And then it's really rare that you're going to need custom solutions. Most of the time, the things that you're going to be building uh, for, for these sorts of clients are going to probably already be covered by some fairly, um, fairly, you know, broad WordPress plugin. You're, you're typically not going to be offering custom solutions in these. So you're not going to be needing to come up with code or fight with chat GPT to get it to spit out the right piece of code that you need. Um, so I wanted to jump into my, uh, process and kind of my kind of uh, bringing clients on board, but I was curious, are there any questions at this point before I slightly shift gears? I have a comment for you. Sure. Uh, you were talking about the monthly recurring revenue. I'm an operator, not a not a, a, a an agency. There's a lot to be said for peace of mind. You know, this is your business, and a couple hundred bucks a month. If you, even if it's not a complex site, to know that there's someone there. Uh, that that's high priority for me as an operator. Absolutely, that's a great point. You know, having having the ability, especially early on in the sales process, to say. Once the site is live, you still can fire off an email or whatever your process is. For me, I utilize a software called Basecamp. I tell clients you can just fire off a message to us in Basecamp, reply to the emails that you get, and we'll just take care of it for you. So yeah, that's a great point. Not something I had included in this presentation, but definitely part of the, the initial sales conversation. Yeah, you're, you're, this is not a group you're selling to, but... <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, so any other questions before I move on? So Jonathan, you you mentioned that um, you know if if someone takes you up on the thirty day money back uh, uh, guarantee, that you're not you're not too far into it yourself, right? Is that because the sites are templated and relatively simple? Is that what you mean by that? That you haven't put a whole lot of development time into them? Yeah, because you know for for that thirty day window, typically the first probably two weeks of that are going to be uh, focused primarily in Figma. They're going to be design, you know, um, mockups before we're, before we're developing anything. So I mean, if they came to me at day twenty nine, we would, you know, I'd be out probably collectively, I don't know, maybe fifteen or twenty hours of of my time and team member time and that kind of thing. But um, you know, in terms of actual dollar value, you would just be out that first month. So you know, maybe. $250 or so you refund that. But in the case where that client did take me up on the, that, um, 
that refund, their mock-up was completely done. So in essence, you know, we, we have now another full mock-up for a roofing company. So if well, ever we have right. any kind of home service, we could just adapt that and probably save right. time. Um, right. So, I mean, you, you will lose out a little bit, but maybe it'll work out in the long term. Yeah. Good. Okay. So the the next thing I was just going to quickly go through a high level overview of what it looks like when when new clients come on board here. Um, so on my website there is a getting started form. Um, it's all over the site at the very bottom. It's at the bottom in the footer of of every page. So somebody could fill this out. It's going to just send me an email. I also created a, a Zapier automation so that it texts me. I, I typically leave my email closed in the workday. But if, if one of these comes through, I want to respond as quickly as I can. So I have Zapier just send me a text and I know to go go respond to it. Um, so what I do normally is I take a really quick look at their current website and just kind of see what they what they have now. And you can generally infer what they're after, whether it be a refresh or if it's super old, may need to, to fully ground up rebuild. Um, so once I have that, I send a partly templated response. So I use a software called Text Expander, and it just a little shortcut is getting started and it kind of pre-fills a, a block. It just says something to the effect of, you probably saw we do things a little bit differently. I was just curious what you're actually after. I give them a really simple sum summary of um, of what we can offer, try to see if we're a good fit. So typically, typically there's some back and forth with the client to figure out, you know, what are they interested in? Um, some, some people want to schedule a phone call and that's fine. I'll, I'll gladly have a, an initial call with clients. Um, some people are fine to interact fully through email. Uh, it kind of goes, goes both ways. And once they, uh, are ready to, uh, to sign up, then I send them a link. Um, and they then go through just a very simple checkout page. Uh, and then there's a Zapier automation that I've built. This is really complicated, so I won't go through it, but basically they check out and it does a bunch of things. It creates a board in our project management system, creates a Google Drive folder for them to upload content to, creates a bunch of pre-filled messages for us in Basecamp, sends the team an email, creates a staging site, and you know, kind of kind of the same things, creates message boards and emails and that kind of thing. So this saves a lot of, of time just on that initial setup phase for the project. But again, this is really only possible because everything is so standardized and, and honed in. Um, and then once they've signed up, there there is a an onboarding form that sent them. And this is kind of a showstopper. I tell them from the outset that this is priority number one for you. You need to go fill out this onboarding form. And of course, probably like your current onboarding forms for your clients, it just says, um, it just is collecting very basic information. What's your business address and contact details? The Give me the, the two sentence elevator pitch of what your business does. Uh, and with those questions, there's about 15 questions or so. That's enough for us to kind of put together what they have now and what their um what information they provided us in the onboarding form to, to really kind of get started. So then I mentioned we create a homepage mockup in Figma, and this is going to be like a full fidelity mockup and look like the real thing, which we're just going to send to the client via a simple little PDF. And all that I ask them for is give us a thumbs up. Well, I'm not, I don't typically um, try to, I, I don't, I don't go to the client saying, please nitpick every part of this. All I want is their buy-in from the, the design perspective and to make sure that fundamentally this looks good enough for us to go ahead and, and start building. Um, and then we once we get that that thumbs up from them, then we'll simultaneously start designing the inner pages and my developer will begin actually building the site in WordPress and, and generate press. Um, and, and a key thing for this is making the the whole process as simple as possible. So Prior to ChatGPT, this was a little bit harder, but you know, coming up with boilerplate placeholder text and images is now just so dead simple that it's far easier for clients to, excuse me, to uh, to tweak things that are present on the page already than it is to try to come up with something. So I'll prompt ChatGPT to come up with a description for a veterinary clinic, and it'll give me something. I'll kind of tweak it, and then I might send that 
you know, back in the mock-up to the client. So that's a key part of this is just making the, the process as seamless as possible. Uh, like I mentioned, I've been doing this for basically a year on the dot. And in that time, I've brought in 11 monthly site clients. Uh, a large part of my my income is based on the, like I mentioned, the custom development white label stuff. But the for any any client that comes in that doesn't fit that, I'm pitching the monthly sites. Not everybody is, is uh, keen on that. Like I said, it does filter out some, but that's okay. And almost always the, they will fall into that middle plan. So if you recall, my middle plan was up to 10 pages and that's $220 a month. And that just is kind of what it's averaged out to. Almost all of them fall into that. I did the math earlier before this call and across the, you know, all the monthly sites that I have, the average works out to $200 a month per site. So certainly, like I said, you know, it's, it's not paying all my bills, but it's, I'm certainly not going to turn down $2,200 a month in, in recurring revenue. I, I suspect you probably wouldn't either. Um, and of course, just like this is probably typically the case for most small businesses, once the website is live, then you very rarely will hear from them. I got an, a, an email yesterday afternoon from one of our monthly site clients and the, the tweak she asked for was changing one word. Other than that, I haven't heard from her in three or four months. So, you know, that so, some clients will be very needy and need things regularly, but for the, for the you know most part, you won't hear from them. Um, and then this kind of goes back to what I mentioned initially, how it might be hard to phase into this, but, you know, after having done this, you know, over 10 times now, we have so many different mockups and templates and sections to pull from that we're rarely starting from scratch now. There's enough assets out there for different business types that you probably already have a, a section with three cards in it or a team member section or you know an about us page that looks good enough that you can tweak. So as you get further into this, it starts to get faster and more optimized, I'm finding. Initially, it feels a little bit like a slog and you're like, you know, I'm not being compensated enough for my time right now, but it gets better, you know, as, as time kind of goes on. And then for me, uh, this actually kind of came about as I was preparing for this, I kind of thought I need to give this, you know, kind of what I'm doing in my process as a rethink for 2024. And I haven't had a, a niche personally, like I mentioned, my, my mentor, he does uh, home service websites. For me, I haven't nailed that niche down, but I'd like to try and figure out what that will be for, for 2024. I think that's the key here to, to being able to grow and scale this is really figuring out what kind of clients you want to work with and what your uh, particular area of expertise might be in. It just makes it so much easier. So that's kind of the rapid fire overview. Uh, that's the all the kind of notes and slides I had, I imagine. There's probably many questions and uh, objections to this. So perhaps we can jump into kind of our question and answer portion. Hopefully we have enough to, to go around. It's a nice model, Jonathan. And I, and, and I think it's, it, to follow my other point about it, just the peace of mind, you know, two or $300 a month for peace of mind is uh is in a, as a, an acceptable realm yeah it's funny you mentioned that actually i i had forgotten i have a local client there um they're like a a small local museum and they the the woman asked me why do you charge monthly and it kind of caught me off guard i was like that's that's actually an interesting question when you phrase it like why why do you charge that way and the answer i came up with on the spot which i actually kind of feel like is reasonably um you know accurate is there's an element of keeping your yourself committed to to projects with this you know monthly income like i'm going in and checking on websites running updates and doing all the things you likely already do for your care plan clients and she was satisfied with that answer but i i think to your point michael it's it's um it keeps both you and the client sort of invested in the project long term which is nice i i've been hiring people to build sites for five years and it's just been a horrible awful grind some of the some of the dynamics i've experienced are one is some some people just don't want to do project work and they, and they want to move on but i want a team player so i, I kind of want the whole package i want someone who can design someone who can build 
and then someone who can be there when I need them. And it's hard to find that combination. Um, a, lot, a lot of people say that I don't want to do design. I hired Codable for a project. Halfway through the project, they said, oh, we don't do design. Oh, okay. So he gave me a plain vanilla thing that I hated. So I, I made a lot of mistakes as a uh, operator. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm going through it now. I'm on fourth, fourth uh, WordPress designer this year. One guy I like, he just got burned out and had to back away. An agency pretended they could do more than they could. Uh, a young guy also pretended to be do more than he could. The, the current guy I just hired two weeks ago, we had an agreed scope of work. And uh, this morning he said, you know what? The stuff, the database stuff you want, I can't do that. I'll do your pages, but I, I can't do the database. So we had to renegotiate the contract. And um, I'm, I'm sharing my experience because I'm, you know, you, you might, got, you guys, you all might, you know, if you're uh, if you're uh, WordPress operators, that might be helpful to hear a client perspective. Um, um, another another uh, difference of opinion we had was he said, "Well, I read, you know, I estimated 20 hours for the project." And he, and he said, well, I spent a lot of time learning stuff. I said, well, I, I hire you because you're an expert. I'm not paying to train you. And he said, well, no, that's fillable time. So there, there's a point of contention in this business that you guys would probably run into. Yeah. So Jonathan, that's pretty good in, in just a year. I mean, if you average 200, if, if the average out to $200 a month, you know, 11 of them, you've got 2,200 of recurring effort revenue right now and do that again. And probably you'll probably do more, probably add on more than 11 sites this year, right? Or in, in 2024, I should say. You'll Certainly hope so, more. yeah. And then, uh, you know, two, two, three years in, it's pretty nice. Yeah, I, I really think this, it has pretty kind nice. of a, yeah. a hockey stick growth. I forgot to mention that once the the term expires, once the 24 month term that I I um set with clients expires, it just drops down to my standard care plan price which is 99 a month. They still get the same level of service, the they just don't get, you know, new pages and designs and stuff included. So I haven't encountered what it's going to be like when that that, you know, 24 months expires. We're not quite there yet, but um the that's a good point that you brought up, David. You know, you're going to have that that yeah. revenue building for for long periods of time. Are you are you tracking how many hours a week you're spending on those eleven clients? No, I I don't I don't track time at all. Yeah. Um, my my team does, and it's very very little. Uh, typically, like I mentioned, most clients we don't hear from at all, so there's just no need to. But for the most part, even the, what I would call the needy ones still only need, you know, maybe two hours a month. It's not typically not very difficult. Jonathan, your timing's interesting. I was just talking to my friend. She was talking to a plumber who had hired a monthly service uh, place out of Alaska, I guess, and it was thousands a month. And I'm assuming oh, wow. that's because it, in, it, it includes uh, SEO and social media posts. But I was surprised that they were willing to pay, you know, in that scale. So I guess... Maybe down the road, you might add, if you have your niche, you might add uh, some social media posting and some SEO specific services in another tier or something. For me personally, I, I've been very intentional not to have anything else. I don't offer anything else, no email or social or you know, no sec separate graphic design, um, kind of because like I mentioned, I want to keep things as simple as possible. But um, to your point, I do have a friend in another group that that does that. He offers uh, other SEO packages that kind of build. For me, I feel like it's a little bit, it's it's outside of my area of expertise. So it's just not something I'm comfortable with offering, but it's, it's certainly doable. It would make, S, make sense. SEO would be the first, the first one to try because it's primarily site-based activities. Sorry, I, I didn't follow I, what I you would... said. I, I think if you're going to do any of those, SEO would be the make the most sense to do next, because a lot of what you do for SEO is out of the website. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It seems the most kind of parallel. Um, my my mentor that I that I mentioned, he he and another SEO company, uh, the the SEO company only does 
optimization. And he, of course, only does websites. They have a very symbiotic referral relationship. They're sending a lot of business back and forth. So I think if if me if I personally started getting a lot of inquiries for SEO, I would find somebody like that. I would just want to refer back and forth. And so, so Jonathan, do you do any SEO? Like, do you insist in, as, as a base level install Rank Math or Yoast or or uh, any of the uh, plugins, Slim SEO or whatever? Um, do you install those just to do basic a basic level of SEO for sure? Included? Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Just the, the basic on-page SEO stuff is is for sure included. Um, Slim SEO is my go-to and okay. just taking taking a, a solid stab at page titles and meta descriptions and stuff, setting a featured image, that kind of thing. Just just the bare bones basics that's required. Right. Um, and, you know, submit the, the sitemap to search console and stuff like that. Things that aren't really time consuming, but still important. Yeah. I mean, you could probably, what you just described could probably be done in an hour or so. Oh, yeah. We have a we have like a post launch checklist and all that stuff is is on it. And Slim SEO is pretty easy. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I I chose it. Again, I'm <laughs> talking about simplicity to to the to the nth degree here, but I chose it because it's just so dead simple. There's there's no real fiddling around. I hate all the SEO plugins that add all the scores and all the extra garbage to the admin panel, and Slim SEO doesn't do that. So. It's been my yeah. choice for a while. And have tons of settings. I yeah, mean, unnecessarily so. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Some of them, yeah, yeah. So so do you have, you talk about the onboarding process and they reach out in an email and you send them a form. Uh, um, do you have clients that you that you really don't even talk to? Um, have really done that way? I, I, every once in a while, in terms of not talk to you, do you mean like no Zoom calls or phone calls? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. That that happens more often than I would I would have thought, honestly. Wow. Um, and I think I think part of that comes down to the investment is so low that people don't feel like they. I don't think the level of of trust has to be so sky high as though you know they're shipping you a check for four thousand dollars. I think I think just there's like a a mental switch there. Um, but still, depending on the client, some people want a, a phone call, um, but most of the time. The what I what I tend to find is the most the most common situation is people want an initial phone call to kind of get to get to know you and understand what you offer and then it's all email based from there. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's kind of I I can see the the that switch flipping is because you feel like well, I'm just buying a website for myself online. <laughs> it's like an e-commerce uh, uh, transaction. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm gonna click here. Yes, they'll build me a site. Click. <laughs> Definitely. Because you can throw it on on the credit card easily, yeah. Like there's there's yeah. not a whole lot of investment there. Yeah. I saw Jennifer, your camera clicked on earlier. I was curious if you had a question. Maybe not. That's okay. I did. Sorry, I'm fighting with my cat who insists that he should be part of the Zoom meeting. Um, he's this is the fourth Zoom meeting he has interrupted this week. I just wanted to know how many times on, on average are your monthly clients requesting changes to their sites i'm hearing you say minimally but i have one client who literally changes pages every month and sometimes yeah. her entire site and so i don't know if putting her on something like that would work like just out, out of curiosity what's that like for you yeah um i think the the most demanding client that that i have is that that museum and even then the term demanding is still probably pretty pretty generous um, or maybe overly generous. Um, the I would say when when I get requests from them, they're typically fairly large, but they're almost always condensed in one email. It's like change this form, you know, go tweak these images, these texts, put these events on the site, and that kind of thing. Um, like I mentioned, I have I have two really excellent overseas contractors, so they're extremely affordable. So even if even if the changes were to take five hours my outlay from that is still less than the monthly bill. So that that's a large factor, I think, in my particular success in this. But like I mentioned, I have a, a, a peer who does this for mental health practices. Both of her team members are US-based and she's able to do it too. So, so surely it can be done. I do think that, um, my, I do say unlimited site edits. Most people don't take advantage of that. Um, you could just quantify it probably just to say maybe 
maybe you get one batch of changes a week. Send them to me on Friday and I'll have them done, you know, Tuesday or something like that. Whatever might work for you. That makes sense. Thank you. Cool. You're welcome. So, so Jonathan, what, what, how, how do you handle images? Do you just tell them they need to, the, you, 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 do you offer that you'll use stock photos if, if they want, or, um, uh, or if they want custom phot photography, that's basically just on them. Yeah, we, we typically are just using pexels and, you know, unsplash and, and websites like that. Um, but I'm, I'm always referring to them just as placeholders. I don't, I don't like to set the expectation with clients that these should remain on there permanently. And I normally just share with them that people can typically see their stockholder stock placeholders and that they should be swapped. And most of the time people have enough photos that across a five or 10 page website, they can replace, even if they have to send you them vertical on their iPhone and you know, you have to crop them. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's fairly typical, but yeah. Most of the time, it's just stock photos that we encourage them to to swap as quickly as possible. Oh, okay, okay. But and but you do the swapping. When yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to think if we had any any client. I was, well, actually, sorry. Let me back up. I share with clients that that they can get into the website and make changes, but of course, if they break stuff, we bill hourly separately to fix it. Um, and. Across all of the clients, I don't think there's anybody that gets in there regularly. Everybody has the ability to, but I don't think so. Typically, it's it's larger clients that have, you know, a marketing person or somebody that that's doing that externally. But that's that's fairly atypical. And and then premium plugins. You, you I'm assuming you use the pro version of Generate Press and Generate Blocks. And so they have that, they get, they basically get that. You yeah. Yeah. That's a great question too. I don't, I don't add any line items for, for plugins like that. If they need something I don't have that's off the wall, like, you know, maybe a, if, if they require like a donation plugin, I'll, I'll give them the fee and pass that on. But if it's like a form plugin or, you know, like you said, for your theme, those kinds of things are just lumped together and kind of factored in sort of across the board, you know, we're probably paying maybe a few hundred dollars a month or excuse me, a year for most of the products. So yeah. really it factors out to be so little for every site every month. Right. And, and what is your stack of pro plugins? What do you normally uh, use? Um, generate press premium gravity or excuse me, um, generate blocks pro uh, gravity forms. Um, the, uh, here, I'll, I'll just open my site real quick. I'm struggling to think off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I use advanced custom fields a lot. Mm -hmm. The pro um, And then trying to think of what else. You know, uh, Perf you know. Matters, the performance plugin. I use that and love it. Uh, WP Grid Builder is fairly common for filtering and search and that kind of thing. Um. And then, did I say Gravity Forms? I can't recall. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And that's about it. There are there are a few other odds and ends that sometimes people need, but just looking at my own site. Oh, Short Pixel is the the image plugin I was thinking of. The image optimization plugin. Um. And that's it. There, you know, like I mentioned, there are other things that sometimes clients will need, but for the most part, you can get ninety percent of the way there. There's a few other free plugins as well. Mm hmm. Do you have a calendar plugin that you go to? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I mentioned earlier is that, that I developed. It's called Pi Calendar. Oh, right. Yeah, forgot about that. Thanks. Uh, but but that came about because we needed it for for a client. And the you know most of the calendar plugins out there are just so bloated and heavy that came up with something a lot more simple. Nice. Yeah, that, that's good. I'm going to check that out because the events calendar is the common one and, and it's a little bit overkill for a lot of applications and yeah, you just need something simple. Uh, yeah, I'm going to check I, it out. I, I featured your Pi calendar at a meetup, I don't know, a month ago. Really? Thank you. I do a, a free resource. I do a weekly WooCommerce called Woo Wednesdays. 
and I tried to do a free thing and I came across your pie calendar. It's cool that you, I meet the guy that actually did it. Yeah. But it's that's awesome. Thank you. It works really well. And yeah. So, but I, I did want to ask a question about your backups. Sure. So you're, you're probably doing more than just relying on your hosting service for backup. And are you using a particular plugin for that? Because WP um, has come up, Backblaze, Updraft, but I just wonder what your opinion was. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Not something I had thought about. Um, the For years and years, I had used uh, Cloudways and then was just doing um, the, the archive, like automatically downloading via FTP. Um, but now I use the the host called Gridpane. Um, and then the backup service I use is Backblaze. So it it does the server backup, to, you know, uh, it does an archive of the sites to the server and then also to Backblaze as well. So just two separate data centers. Yeah, thank you. There's uh, two or three on here that use um, grid pain. Awesome, yeah. I'm I'm really happy with it. I haven't been on it that long. I think I moved in like June, um, but it's I'm I'm happy for sure. Yeah, they they speak highly of it. They're in this group. I think there's three of them. So it's got its quirks, but you know everything does. And and why not simply use the the backup provided by the host? Um, my thought would be that if something happened to the host, I don't want to be. I don't want to have just one copy of of the data. Um, it's kind of like the the I came came from an IT background. That's what I went to school for. There's like the three two one philosophy. It's three copies of your data in two separate locations, um, or maybe it's one two three. I, I always forget the orientation, but you want three copies in two separate places. I I think is what it uh, what that that little like saying is supposed to be. And since of course like you know if if you had like a little external hard drive that you could back it up to that would be one thing but none of us actually have access to the servers that they're on so i think it's just really an insurance policy okay that's, that's a, also a feature i suppose that you can use as part of the sales process would you say i'm sorry oh it just that the backup could be as, um, used as a feature of your service as well it could be, yeah. I I typically don't touch on those sorts of technical details at all. Um, but you know, if that was relevant to your clients, absolutely. Maybe for a slightly more technical audience, but for most of my clients, they're veterinary clinics and AC guys, so they don't give a hoot about a backup um, as long as it runs, as long as it's still functional. <laughs> Have you been using a generate blocks or or generate press patterns? Uh much for your um, reusable elements and stuff? Have you found those useful? Uh, not so much the patterns, but the the um, native Gutenberg reusable blocks, absolutely. We use reusable blocks like very frequently. Um, but being able to copy and paste between sites with, with Gutenberg is uh, maybe more akin to what you're talking about, but we don't use the actual patterns feature specifically. I think they're calling it synced blocks now. Yeah, it's renamed again. It's had like three different names now, I think. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I don't know, two months ago. It's just huh. because that this question of patterns come up in several meetups about, well, what good are they? Well, a huge time feature, right? I mean, you can all your formatting, everything can be done. So if you use them effectively, it's a it's a great tool. And I think WordPress is going the right way with it, but yeah, the name changes and stuff. Uh, to the earlier gentleman's comment there about the um, the backups, and I think he was alluding to the value proposition if you're trying to like uh, win a client over, right? You just say, hey, I'm including this as a service and it's triple backup and these are the reasons and it's the value proposition that you're using to sell the service. I think that what, what he was uh, either alluding to or suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, certainly could be. Where do you find ACF useful? I, the sites sound simple enough that I wouldn't have thought you'd you'd find much use for it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, for for most sites, it's it's not really that useful. Um, 
for typically for um, ACF, it's what I mentioned for like the white label custom development work that I do. That's just like, you know, a crucial, crucial part of it. Um, I used to use ACF more, especially in, in these simple sites for, for dynamic data, um, you know, use cases and for conditions. But now there's a plugin that I use pretty much ubiquitously that's free called block visibility. And I mean, that thing is such a powerhouse that there's there's almost no need to to do the things with ACF on simple sites that I used to have to do. Um, but but still definitely use it in custom development work pretty much all the time. Thanks, I'll check that plugin out. It sounds it's, interesting. Excuse my French, it's badass. I love it. <laughs> What's it called again? It's called Block Visibility. Yeah, I've, I've heard really good things. It gets really good reviews. Like if you look it up on YouTube, people rave about it. I mean, it's incredible. The, I Go yeah, ahead, Brian. The, the, sorry, the, the author of it uh, works for Automatic. I don't think he did when he wrote it first, but he definitely does, does work for them now. Uh, it used to be pro, but now it's all free. Yeah, it's wild. He he just made it free for everyone, which is really cool. Um, what it, What it can do is if you're familiar with a builder like Oxygen or Bricks, they have the their conditions built in, so you can you can show and hide blocks based on times and dates, or URL parameters, or hide things under specific circumstances. And of course, Gutenberg doesn't have anything like that natively. Um, I I don't think Cadence does. I'd generate blocks definitely doesn't. Uh, so this plugin, my favorite feature from Oxygen was conditions. I used it all the time, and now being able to do it with with Gutenberg with with this plugin is just like. It's it's awesome. Yeah, give me an example of when you would use the conditions. Uh, well, one of them that I just used was um, for my local museum client. They mm -hmm. there was a page that had been set to to private, and this is a client that never gets into the back end. But they were like, I can't remember what that looks like, and obviously, you know, I could have taken a screenshot. But what I did was. Funny enough, now a screenshot would have been way easier, actually. Now that I'm saying this out loud, that's actually really funny. Um, you can, on like the, the page container, I could set a condition that says only show this if a URL parameter is present. So all I did was just, you know, destinhistoryandfishingmuseum.com slash and then the little question mark. And then I said show equals true. So like if you came to that page and that URL, URL parameter wasn't present, you couldn't see the content. But because I could just copy that link straight to her, when she clicked that link, it just popped up. Um, and the page loaded as though, you know, everything was fine. Um, a more practical use case would be something like show show between these dates, but before and after, hide it. Um, or I'm trying to think of what else off the top of my head. There's, there's just a broad range of use cases. And you can do that on a section, not just a whole page, but you can do it on a section. You could do it down to an individual button. You could do it as as widely or as narrowly as you need. Yeah, it's really really powerful. Once you once you use it a couple of times, you're just going to start seeing use cases all over your site for it. Yeah, it's been on my list because I've seen so many YouTube things, you know, to people raving about it, and then also raving about how it was there was a free and a premium, and now it's just all free. <laughs> you know. I have at least two videos on it raving about that exact thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, also, actually, it's worth mentioning, you know, for those of you that are familiar with advanced custom fields, um, block visibility also allows you to show and hide sections based on attributes of a user's profile. So, like, for instance, I mentioned I do that that white label work. Most of the clients that I get are for homeowners associations and those that have like private access portals. So we can create sections that only show up if this person is, let's say, you know, an active member or they're an administrator, so they should see everything. So we can look at fields on their user profile and show it without writing any code at all because of block visibility. So, you know, like I said, you could, you could show a button or you could check user profiles and build a membership directory and you know it, that's why i say the the use cases are so incredibly vast oh yeah there's there's the link to it
And then I know that you have not uh, uh, um, jumped on the Bricks Builder bandwagon. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I would. I'd be curious. I know you have a video about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That video stirred up definitely some uh, some feelings from people, to say the <laughs> least. Um, I'm curious if if you don't feel comfortable opening the mic and sharing, if you want to drop in the the chat, if what what um you know page builder do you use Elementor or Oxygen, Gutenberg, whatever you use, I'd I'd love to hear. Maybe I can tailor your question a little bit more based on what you guys use. You're asking the group, right? Yes, yes, everybody. Yeah. Bricks Builder, ACSS, yeah. No surprise. Gutenberg, generate blocks, some ACF, cool. Cadence and Astra, awesome. We have a, a very diverse range. Pretty much everybody is represented. Cadence or Divi, yeah, wow, we have <laughs> basically everything. Used to use Elementor, but now Bricks, ACSS and Frames. Awesome. Well, um, it seems like nearly everybody is is familiar with, with Bricks. Um, Block editor page formerly known as Gutenberg. Yeah. Generate blocks with bricks. Okay, cool. That's an interesting combo. Um, so you know, for for many, many, many years, I used Oxygen Builder exclusively. That's what I built my YouTube channel on. My my first course that I ever made was on Oxygen Builder. So I was a you know huge advocate of it. Still obviously has a, a very significant place in my heart. And I still manage many client websites with Oxygen. Um but in in 2021, I kind of got into uh, just, you know, I had such an overly complex business. The, the clients we were taking on had massively complex projects. Costs were just really, really high. Um, and of course, I didn't really know what was about to happen in summer of last year when the Oxygen developer created that whole new page builder and created Breakdance. Um so at that time, I, I I took some time off. I I honestly had like a really rough, probably six weeks, just feeling like the bottom had been pulled out, and you know the whole my whole business was going to collapse. So I spent a lot of time just really evaluating what I wanted to do in terms of page builders and processes. And ultimately, over the course of a few months, I landed on the Generate Suite and kind of switched to this monthly product uh, late in you know late last year. Um, so a large part of it came down to the fact that I just wanted a, a simple, just sim to simplify everything, but also make it easier for clients. I have a, I have um, for all of the the custom development work that's all in Generate Blocks too, but almost always there's somebody internally that will be coming behind me and and either editing content, adding new pages, and that sort of thing. And with Oxygen or Bricks, it's just like not possible for that to happen. People can just mess up the the site too badly, but with the the blocks approach, it's far more uh, it's far more achievable to get somebody in who's reasonably adept at WordPress and they won't detonate the site. So really it was, it's kind of an interesting cohesion of a bunch of different things all at one time that kind of led me to the generate route. And I'm good friends with Kyle Van Dusen from the admin bar and he's a massive blocks advocate. So, you know, there's a bit of, a bit of, uh, you know, his, his influence kind of rubbed off on me as well. So you, you mentioned multi-site. Are, are you building all these sites on multi-site? No, no. I actually have barely even used it. Ah, I thought maybe that. I maybe I misspoke. I apologize if I said something wrong. It's all right. I just thought I heard multi-site, and I thought maybe you're just talking about multiple sites. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just multiple. I I must have meant. Cool. Yeah, I could I could see the the block the, the you know the block builder you know Gutenberg plus generate being easier for clients to handle you know. I mean, yeah, I was bricks, gonna say bricks can become overwhelming. Certainly, so, yeah, and I found it I found it a lot more difficult to uh, to plug in you know my contractors into, like even even somebody who's fairly adept at development logs into something like bricks or oxygen and they're like, whoa, this is this is crazy. And then especially if you're using something like ACSS, you know, you you really have to understand classes and 
what's going on under the hood. It's really difficult to have somebody come behind you with tools like that. And I had experienced that for, you know, at least a year or, or more with oxygen and the headaches that come with that. So, um, so for me, when, when the kind of exodus from oxygen happened to go to bricks, I just decided, I think I'm going to let that ship sail, especially because the other, the other big thing that I feel like is, um, is, is going to happen is people are going to get closer and closer to Gutenberg core and it will become better and better. Maybe not in the short term, but I, I feel like long term, the, the closer you can be to, to Gutenberg core and the block editor as a whole, you're probably going to be better off. Who knows what's going to happen with full site editing that, that could be a whole nother curveball. We'll, we'll see what happens. Anything else, folks? I guess on that note, uh, it's always fun to to uh, riff off that with the fact that one thing that we like about Bricks is that we do get to use the block editor. And, you know, nobody, like you said, it's not an environment you want to hand to a client. But for those clients that do want to get their hands dirty, putting a blog together, a blog post or whatnot with, with some blocks, you can use the post content um uh aspect of bricks yeah. so you can have a blog page where that's where they go and they can use the blocks in, in my case i like to to try to get them to use the generate blocks but they can really use all the ones that are there unless i restrict them but that way they don't need to care about bricks but i can build a site in bricks and they can still do the blog posts with the block editor yeah that's a great point yeah. Anything else, folks? Happy holidays to everybody. Happy holidays. Likewise. I want to agree with the gentleman's assessment because I've been kind of saying that stay close to the block editor as much as possible because it's that code on top of code. I left page builders about five years ago before the block editor was really Gutenberg was really ready, but it's definitely turned the corner. And that the whole question of the full site editing, that's everybody's question, right? When will it get there? And I think they're going to, with this new release today, I think they're getting closer, but it seems like the main problems of the biggest sticklers and these meetups have to do with people using this full site editor and they just can't make things work. Uh, but I think they'll get there. So I'm optimistic. So Jonathan, thank you so much for your presentation. And David, thank you for hosting. I really appreciate the meetup. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. So. All right, folks. Well, I think that's it then. Well, Jonathan, thanks. Thanks for staying up late, working late there. Of course. And I uh, really appreciate it. And this was fun. Yeah, really Really fun. great. Thank you all for your time and yeah. for listening intently. If If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be glad to answer. Yeah, check out his channel. Check out his YouTube channel, guys. Look, look him up. Uh, he used to be called Permaslug, which was a great name. And he's changed it to his, his name, which is good, too. <laughs> Maybe I should go backwards. Uh, Permaslug is, is a great name. <laughs> Only people in WordPress got it. Outside of that, everyone was like, what right. the hell is that? <laughs> so, all right, everybody. Uh, we will be back at it. Uh, it will be December, if you can imagine, the next time we have our meetup. And um, I guess that's it for this evening. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take it easy, folks. Yep.